And now at one o'clock, the BBC News with Maxine Mahwini. In the last hour, it's been announced that a British man was among four victims of Thursday's terror attack in the Swedish capital, Stockholm. Officers have revealed that the main suspect, a 39-year-old man from Uzbekistan, was an asylum seeker who was facing deportation. He'd also expressed sympathy with extremist groups. Dan Johnson is live now in Stockholm for us. Dan. Yes, this is a rally in the centre of Stockholm, just about to get underway. Thousands of people who have come here to show their support for the victims of this attack and to send a message that they are opposed to violence and acts of terrorism. And this morning, as you say, more information from the police investigating this attack. Here's what they had to say earlier. All four deceased are now identified and the uh, family to the deceased are notified. Uh, there are two Swedish citizens among the uh, deceased and there are two foreign citizens. So confirmation that not just Swedes by this, two Swedes who died in the attack along with a British man, the UK Foreign Office has confirmed, and his family is being supported here in Sweden and in the UK. Okay, as well, a Belgian citizen too. And investigators confirming this morning that their main suspect, a 39-year-old from Uzbekistan, applied for residency here in Sweden back in 2014. And I do apologise. So we have some problems there with the uh, audio and the video. The Defence Secretary, Sir Michael Fallon, says Russia is to blame for every civilian death in last week's chemical weapons attack in Syria. His words follow a decision by Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson to cancel a visit to Moscow due tomorrow. Now, that move has been criticised by Labour and the SNP, as our political correspondent Susanna Mendonca reports. America's military response to the gas attack that left 89 people dead in Syria was clear. But now attention is turning to the role of Russia and its support for the Syrian government. The British Defence Secretary Michael Fallon accused the Kremlin of being complicit in the chemical attack, describing it as a war crime that happened on Russia's watch. Writing in the Sunday Times, he said, By proxy, Russia is responsible for every civilian death last week. If Russia wants to be absolved of responsibility for future attacks, Vladimir Putin needs to dismantle Assad's chemical weapons arsenal for good. Speaking to the BBC's Andrew Marr show, the International Development Secretary said it was time for concerted pressure to be applied on Russia. This isn't a, just about one voice. This is about the international community coming together. And our foreign secretary is working with his American counterpart, as that is the right thing to do. Following the US airstrike on the Sherat Air Base in Homs, Britain's Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson announced that he was cancelling a planned trip to Russia, but his American counterpart, Rex Tillerson, will go ahead with a trip there later this week, prompting ridicule from Mr Johnson's critics. And the idea that the foreign secretary can't be trusted because he might uh, pursue his own line or have an independent thought or cross over what the Americans are going to say just, just makes him look like some sort of mini-me to the, to, to the United States of America. Pictures last night on Russian TV showed what they said were aircraft flying once again from the base damaged by American missiles. And British hopes of influencing the Kremlin's position on Syria seem slim after the Russian Foreign Ministry said Boris Johnson's cancelled visit showed that the UK had no real influence over world affairs. Susanna Mendonca, BBC News. At least 25 people have been killed and dozens injured following a blast at a Coptic Christian church in Egypt. The blast in the city of Tanta, north of Cairo, took place as worshippers gathered to celebrate Palm Sunday. There's also been a separate attack on a church in Alexandria. Len McCluskey, the leader of the UK's biggest trade union, Unite, today demanded that the Labour Party investigates what he claims are attempts by certain Labour MPs to undermine his campaign for a third term. 
Mr McCluskey's bid to continue as Unite's General Secretary is being challenged by Jared Coyne. The result of this bitter contest could impact the future of the Labour Party, as our industry correspondent John Moylan reports. He's the former Liverpool dock worker who rose to become the most powerful trade union leader in Britain. But he's up against this man, Gerald Coyne, politically to Len McCluskey's right, who believes that the UK's biggest union needs to change. Make sure that you do vote because it's really important. Campaigning in Nottingham, Gerald Coyne says the union needs to focus on the challenges of Brexit, insecure work and increasing automation. And he's scathing about what he calls Len McCluskey's meddling in the Labour Party. I'm standing because I believe the union has spent too much time messing in Westminster politics. And actually what we need to do is make sure that we're focused on making our members' priorities absolutely top of the agenda. This contest matters because whoever ends up occupying the General Secretary's office on the seventh floor of the Unite headquarters here in central London will have an influence which stretches from workplaces right through to Westminster. Unite is the UK's biggest trade union and of course it is the biggest donor to the Labour Party. What's more, Len McCluskey has been one of the most powerful supporters of Jeremy Corbyn. Unite put £225,000 into Mr Corbyn's leadership campaigns. He says he's standing on his record, that he spends 90% of his time on industrial matters and he rejects accusations of political meddling. Of course we're involved, but always driven by Unite's policy, determined by our members. It's my job to make certain that their views, their policies are heard in the corridors of powers. If I have to kick doors down, I'll do that. Uh, but the idea that I spend too much time meddling in Westminster politics is, is ridiculous. There is a third challenger seen as politically to the left of Len McCluskey. Ian Allenson says he's the grassroots candidate. I think I'm the one candidate in this election who hasn't worked at the top of the union for decades and I know the kind of frustrations and experiences of members first hand and I think that needs shaking up and putting right. The political stakes are high. Seasoned Westminster watchers believe the race could define the future direction of the Labour Party. It feels like a proxy battle for the Labour leadership. There's no question Corbyn will be watching this result and he will be hoping it goes his way and Len McCluskey wins because if Gerard Coyne wins, he knows that he'll have another enemy. Whoever wins will lead Unite through to the next election. Voting in this increasingly bitter battle closes in just over a week. John Moylan, BBC News. Now more than 20,000 people, including Princes Charles, William and Harry, are gathering in northern France today to mark the centenary of one of the bloodiest battles of the First World War. Thousands of Canadian troops died in four days of fighting on the Battle of Vimy Ridge. Duncan Kennedy is there for us now. Duncan. It's Maxine, twin commemorations here today. Here at Vimy Ridge itself, behind me, is where Canadians fought, died and eventually won. And in nearby Arras is where Scottish troops have today been remembered for their part in the wider battle that took place here during the First World War. It took more than 3,500 Canadian lives to secure this hill, a scale mirrored by today's symbolism. Here, Prince Charles with Princes William and Harry are marking the 100th anniversary of a battle that changed Canadian identity forever. It really gives me a sense of pride, a sense of identity, um, and a sense of uh, sadness for what happened during the war. The battle for Vimy Ridge only lasted four days and was Canada's national coming-of-age moment when its forces combined to defeat the Germans holding the upper ground. In nearby Arras, Scottish losses in the wider fight were also remembered today. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. So ferocious was the fighting in this region, the average daily death toll exceeded that of the Somme or Passchendaele. Among those to die was 26-year-old Sergeant David Wood from Edinburgh. Well, we wouldn't be here without them, would we? We wouldn't be, you know, have, be free and to do what we want when we want. So they fought for us and died for us. So, you know, have to remember them and thank them. 
The Queen sent a message saying it was our duty to remember and honour those who served so valiantly at Vimy Ridge and throughout the First World War. Duncan Kennedy, BBC News, at Vimy Ridge. Well, the next news on BBC One is at 6.35 this evening. From all of us, though, bye-bye for now.